This Week in Radio Tech, episode 155, is brought to you by Axia Audio and Axia X Nodes. One day, all your audio gear will have an Ethernet jack. Until then, there's X Nodes. And now, our feature presentation. Twerd. Where did multiband audio processing come from, and who brought a much better audio level meter to broadcasters and recording studios? <laughs> the same guy did both. All right, calm down. He says that to everyone. This calls for immediate discussion. What's up, Dad? Yeah, all your days are belong to us. From his palatial office of important business. Or in a choice hotel in a distant land. This is Kirk Harnack. Mike Duro joins Chris Tarr, Chris Tobin, and me to talk early multiband audio processing and the famous Duro loudness meter. You're dialed in to This Week in Radio Tech. Hey, it's time for This Week in Radio Tech. I'm Kirk Harnack, your host. Glad to be along with you. We have uh, this show on every week, almost every week, where we talk about radio technology. Sometimes we go way back into the annals of history and talk about radio from back then. Sometimes we talk about radio of the future and what it's going to be like in a year or two or ten, if we can possibly guess that. But help, to help me guess that, I have a couple of uh, regular co-hosts who keep up on the latest, work on the old stuff, and tell us all about it. First of all, I want to introduce from uh, Manhattan, New York, the best dressed engineer in radio. Ladies and gentlemen, please put your hands together for Chris Tobin. Hey, Chris, how are you? Why, thank you, Kirk. I'm doing well. I'm just getting ready for Winter Storm Nemo. For those of you not may, may be aware, we have a st- winter storm coming by the Northeast and uh, going to drop some uh, snowflakes somewhere in the order of 12 inches to 18 inches. So it should be fun. Other than that, though, I'm uh, presently working with the folks at Music Cam USA, CCS. Doing IP video and, and audio and codecs for full disclosure, so everyone's well informed. All right, well, good deal. Thanks for being with us, Chris, and also the other Chris from Muckwanago, Wisconsin. Ladies and gentlemen, it's Chris Tarr, the Geek Jedi, the Engineer. Hey, Chris, how are you? Every so often, I pull my head out of my annals, and uh, I'm here to talk. <laughs> uh, I am the uh, director <laughs> of uh, engineering and operations for WYMS 88.9 Radio Milwaukee. I'm also a contributing writer to Radio Guide Magazine. Uh, I uh, co-founded the website uh, broadcastengineering.info, the virtual engineer, and am a contract engineer all over the place. Plus, I just uh, taking care of the snow that Chris is going to be getting very shortly. Just barreled through here and dropped 10 inches in my front yard. So I get to go fire up the snowblower after this is over and clean up that mess. Hey, does, does all that snow make geocaching all the more interesting? It does. You know, I don't do a lot of geocaching in the snow just because I'm just not a mm. fan of getting cold and wet. But I've done it because <laughs> there are some fun ones. Okay. Well, cool. I, I, I need to get, man, I just need to get back in geocaching. It's such a good thing to do with the kids. It's an activity that geeks like us, can, we can walk around with a GPS and actually be doing something with it, you know, besides tracking big game or whatever. Oh, yeah. yeah. Well, I, and and, uh, and my, my son and I are actually going to be teaching uh, the geocaching class this summer for the rec department in the area. Here. Oh, okay. Cool. So that'll cool. be fun. Hey, well, joining us, we've been promoting uh, this guest for a while because I'm just delighted and excited to have uh, this fella on the show with us. Uh, his name is Mike Duro, and he's coming to us from – Mike, where are you coming to us from? We're out of uh, Woodland Hills, which is Los Angeles County, so we're oh. in Southern California. Well, Mike Duro, if you've been in radio almost any time at all, you probably know the name Mike Duro, especially if you're an old guy like me or Chris Tobin or almost like Chris Tarr. One of the first audio processors I ever saw had the name Duro on it. Now, Mike, I tell you what, other engineers watching the show know something about your name and, and, and a little bit about what you invented. But I think we ought to start a couple, a few years before uh, the DAP, the Discriminant Audio Processor, and kind of you know, tell us what led you up to the point of uh, coming up with this notion of multiband audio processing. What did you do before you, uh, you, you invented this thing? Well, I was a recording engineer, although I've also loved RF and uh, picked up my first transmitter uh, before I was even in my 20s and went nuts from there. But in recording, uh, when we heard the material that we recorded on the radio, you would hear uh, the lower frequencies modulate down the rest of the frequencies. And uh, so those were wideband AGC amplifiers. Uh, and a limiter that protects the transmitter is strictly uh, just a voltage regulator. 
and it, you know, didn't think about music or program, just that it would always try to, excuse me for talking with my hands, hold uh, the level into the transmitter. Um, so I wanted to come up with something that would keep that level in there, but not take away the the fidelity of what we were trying to, to mix. In other words, we had passages where maybe just a little soft piano and then a t- little turnaround and then the drums would pound back in. Uh, mm-hmm. On the air, you would feel the, the piano being brought up to full power and then the drums would push it all back down again. So you were getting this remixing effect. And uh, if those who've played with limiters, since they're, they're so many today and they're not too expensive if you take one a, a wide band limiter and set it up for maybe 10 db of agc or compression and you can take a second one in parallel uh, with the first one but set it to where it normally isn't doing too much at all the second mm-hmm. one will mask the effect of the first one what well, i didn't know that really you know you have a ratio there uh you know 3 db but it's okay yeah. you still have power there now, the idea was to take it one further. Let's add a third limiter, and we can now move the second one into 10 dB and move the first one into 20 dB if we want, and then the last one paralleled up would be just at threshold. And then uh, the idea of, well, why don't they just put in very soft slopes so we can keep the bass notes from getting into the high channel and causing control action, and uh, the same with the highs into the low channel, and then the band passed. It was never to be an equalizer. It was to be a colorless limiter, if you will. M- uh, Mike, but- if, if, you don't, if you don't mind too much, I, I want to no. go back and, and cover something in a little bit more detail that you brought up at first. And that was the, the, you know, what, what the cause of this problem was in the first place. And that was when, when audio is coming into a wideband automatic gain device typically a compressor, or it might have been something faster that we tend to call a, a, a limiter. And, and uh, uh, we, we, you, you covered that real quickly and, just, and told us that there was a problem with that, especially when you have very divergent kinds of, of audio coming into it. Let's say you have a voice or a piano, as I think you mentioned, and then in the background, or maybe even, even equal in volume, you have drums or maybe a bass guitar going dum, dum, like this. I think what you what you intimated was that this this bass note ends up uh, modulating the, the 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 upper frequencies the the voice or the piano and so we end up getting a, a, a kind of a tremolo effect or an, an inner mod effect mm-hmm. uh, of the, the the bass note affecting the the, uh, the upper range frequencies. Well, you know why, uh, Kirk is is that uh, just like an RF, the higher the frequency, the less amplitude. So it isn't equal footing for all musicians into this limiter. And to explain mm. that, you know, the woofer is 15 inches and the tweeter is only 2 inches. Uh, so the physics, uh, if we look at one second of time, you have 50 cycles or hertz uh, of a bass note. And then mm-hmm. you might have a fiddle player that's got 6,000 cycles. Yeah. So we by ear would automatically bring the amplitude of the violin player down compared to the amplitude of the bass player so they're not ah, equal amplitude yeah, yeah. they're equal power to our ear so, so we can end up having actually two effects the effect i was alluding to is kind of an intermod effect and you're alluding to the other effect where the bass note or a drum just absolutely pushes the agc down so that everything gets quieter or, or the bass is now the the thing the loud thing that's controlling it all you know what I remember having a wideband uh, a, a compressor system on a little AM station that I, that I worked at when I was fresh out of high school. And there was a song by Kenny Rogers called The Coward of the County. And if you're as old as I am, you remember this song very well. And it had a very strong bass line. And then behind that, there was, there were, uh, was a string section, uh, or maybe, maybe a string section, but this, the, the, the bass note was not constant. It was there and gone and there and gone. And the, the rest of the audio would suck up when the bass note was gone. When the bass note came along, everything would get pushed back down. And this was really a horrible effect. And that it ended up prompting, I didn't know about the Duro uh, audio processing back then. I ended up buying a multiband in Avonics to go in there. And it more or less solved the problem because it, it, the bass was taken care of by a band or two on its own. Is, is that the effect that you're talking about? 
Well, yes, uh, but we didn't do it with uh, discriminating uh, a lot of frequencies uh, mm -hmm. because that would remix where you have a piano note that's ringing out uh, with yeah. this maybe this gliding violin in the background. You would feel the timbre of the violin change during the time that the piano was hitting. So it's, you know, that that was sort of a dynamic equalizer where we were just trying to be as, you know, transparent if you'll, you know, believe uh, that you can get using yeah. AGC, you know. So uh, that was the whole idea. But when you when you set up the uh, the old DAP, you would take its output and sum it with what's feeding the device out of phase and then null it against the source. And then you knew that it was power flat. It was not electrically flat. So it wouldn't pass a proof of performance with the FCC. But in the rule uh, book, you can have a switch to switch. If you called it an effects device, you can switch uh -huh. it out during test. So we okay. put that switch okay. in. That took out the discrimination, just left the peak limiter, and uh, passed the test. And you put it back in the line and uh, use it you know, dynamically. So would... Was your original idea not necessarily to increase the amount of power in the signal, but simply to get rid of this bad effect that wideband processing uh, had on the audio? Well, the benefit of uh, being that it was a multiband, it automatically gave you more power, that you yeah. were getting support. So if you were to listen to what's feeding the device, uh, and you can hear more openness than you did on the output of the device, but you didn't feel a, a lot of coloring taking place. It's just that it right. seemed to right. bring things up. So you're lessening, you know, shortening the dynamics. So it did make it louder. So and that's why it it took off for us really fast. Can I tell you a quick story? Yeah, please. There was uh, there was a station in Fresno, uh, KYNO, Kino. Uh, they were a breaking station. This was one that was run by Gene Chenault and Bill Drake. And uh, oh. they were where record companies would send their records. They would be played, and then other stations across the nation in Canada would copy them if, if the record was successful. Well, we went there uh, one evening, met with Ken Lee Jones, the engineer, and uh, we had to wait till midnight in order to put the DAP in. They, didn't wanna, they were in ratings, and they didn't want to disturb the audio. So we put her down and drove around, and, and Kenley was very excited and happy. Uh, Kay and I went to a hotel, went to sleep, and on our way out of town, we kept hearing it go in and out. We'd hear the old Volumax and Automax system come in, everything drop back, and then you'd hear it pop back up again. And uh, the man, uh, the program director, was breaking his own rules. He wouldn't let us put it on earlier, but he was probably making telephone calls and patching this thing in and out. We felt very good. Well, just <laughs> after that, we suddenly just skyrocketed for K&I. I, I would, uh, it never knew I'd be a manufacturer. I thought I would always be a recording engineer or work around radio. And so that was a, a, a bonanza for, for the two of us that, so many stations wanted to have whatever this station used. And I think you've seen this too, uh, Kirk, uh, in what you're doing, and people find out what one person's doing, and they want the same thing. Yeah, that, that's true. I, I guess I do know what that's like to some degree. Now, okay, so you you had this notion to to, to uh, make this this three-channel, this, this three-band audio processor. You called it the discriminant audio processor, or, or the DAP. Tell me what in your mind, what does the word discriminate mean? Well, when I was working with uh, Bill Losmondis, who was uh, a fellow who uh, came up with the op amp, um, uh, wonderful fellow, and he was helping me work out crossovers too. And uh, the language he used, which is sort of a motion picture phrase, you want to discriminate these things from, you know, so uh, that, that just stuck with me. Another phrase that stuck with me, though we only used it in the, the first book, was uh, psychoacoustics. And uh, there was a f the fellow who helped build the prototype boards of this thing was Mike Callahan, who's with Clear Channel here in town. What? Really? And, uh, Mike Callahan? Yep. Oh, my and goodness. Mike, I, I've, I've met Mike. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and Mike also helped Kay and I write the first book. So uh, we were trying to explain how you could do these, you know, compression, but not feel it. And uh, 
Mike was the one because I think he had a problem with with one of his ears uh, being a military uh, or being from the military. He dug out a encyclopedia and looked up a phrase he remembered, and that was psychoacoustics. And I said, boy, that kind of describes the thing. Uh, you know, something's taking place, but you don't necessarily, you know, know what. Or so uh, we wrote that down. It's funny, just a few years later at the NAB, we'd see guys with badges saying they're psychoacoustic engineers. <laughs> yeah. So, so I guess it's a psycho-optic. Uh, what we're doing here is... So that's right. <laughs> yeah. So, um, okay, so this discriminant audio processor, uh, you, now you had to come up with, with, I guess, what you felt like was the right places to, to separate these bands. Uh, now, uh, people, uh, Mike Phillips in the chat room has been talking about uh, some, some uh, things like a 6 dB per octave slope and break points at 120 hertz and 6.5 kilohertz. T t what, what was your method of experimenting to find out you know, what's the right place to, to call this band the low band and this band the mid band and this band the high band? How did you come up with that? Well, it, uh, back in those days, you know, uh, still uh, we didn't have as much uh, amplitude on the low frequencies. The thump, thump, tinkle, tinkle stuff started happening after the production of the DAP. And, uh, but, uh, you know, the crossover point was just to keep the, uh, the bass notes from getting into the mid. Though, you know, it would take a little more energy to get it into the control of the mid. And the mid, would, if that happened, still the high frequency would help mask what was taking place on both the low and the mid. And so it's just always, uh, you know, vice versa. There's always this masking taking place from the channels that aren't laboring under what's laboring the other two. Is that making any yeah. sense, I hope? <laughs> yeah, you, you know, Mike, I've been asked to describe multiband processing, of course, a number of times for, you know, for, for uh, bona fide uh, engineers who've been doing this for a long time and for groups of, and for, for program directors. And I, I tend to say, well, what we do is we divide the audio up into several bands and each band has a little man inside. He's got a volume control. And so the, the bass guy, he's got his own volume control to control the bass. And if it's too weak, he'll turn it up. And if it's too loud, he'll turn it down. And there's another guy for the mid-range. And there's another guy for the high frequencies. Or if it's a, you know, a four-band or a five-band processor, we'll, we'll talk about four or five you know, little men with volume controls. So uh, and then I described that, well, this way, it's not all on one guy to keep the volume at the right level, uh, we divide that that job up among several guys, each for their own you know area of of audio response, and this helps um, one guy you know a guy that's adjusting the bass from also you know twanging on the the, the vocals or the violins or whatever it may be. Is is that a reasonable uh, analogy? Well, I think that with some of the units, it would be Kirk. Uh, we, yep. I. You know, if, if somebody recorded something thin and tinny, I wanted it to come through the processor thin and tinny. I didn't want to ah, change yeah. their arrangement. So, again, we were trying to be transparent. And the thin and tinny would cause the upper bands to work hard, but the bass band would help mask that. So, uh, you know, but when the guys would use the output to shape the sound of their station, they would love to hear those high frequencies. So they boost the output of the high uh, channel wow. up. Unfortunately, now it wasn't there to mask the low and vice versa. So now you were hearing this squeezing from the high end. Pardon me for I have to talk with my fingers sometimes. Is that, is that an engineer if, if you're, thing? If you're listening to this podcast, <laughs> just imagine uh, Mike making shapes and signals with his, his fingers. Um, so uh, hey, I, you know I've been I've just I, I'm so guilty of this. I I don't even give Chris Tarr, Chris Tobin a room to squeeze a question in sideways here. So uh, how about how about we check with Chris Tobin first? Uh, Chris, I know that you've dealt with a, a, quite a bit of multiband gear, and maybe even some of Mike DeRose. What what uh, what question might you have Abs at this at this moment? Absolutely. Um, well, let me see. Since we're in a storytelling mood, um, I, I would say that when I first started out in the business, uh, one of the first radio stations in my uh, my market that was using a DAP 310. Uh, I was intrigued by the audio quality of the station. It was a uh, new music format or alternative rock and roll, they call it today, punk music back in the day. Um, but the transparent sound of the, the, I had the original recording at home. I listened to it on the radio and went, wow, this is really close, but had a little extra you know, nuance or uh, you know, gravitas to it that sort of jumped out on the radio. That was the work of the local engineer using your boxes. What I came to, come, came to find out when I went to visit him, 
I said, hey, you know, your station sounds really good. I, I, uh, I'm chief engineer of a local college station. I'm doing this stuff. I also have built some things on my own and do other th dabble with audio and transmitters. And your station, though, has a very smart sound to it. You showed me the two uh, DAP 310s in the rack in the engineering office. First time I got to see one. Heard about it, but never got to see one in action. Then I noticed, he says, well, by the way, the reason the station sounds the way it does is because I'm doing something a little different than traditional FM stereo. I was like, really? <laughs> He proceeds to take the cover off of one of the DAP 310s, pulls out a card, and the DAP 310 meters go to the far left, which means they're not doing anything. <laughs> and the station is still on the radio. I'm saying, well, I still hear audio out of two speakers, but yet I only see one of the two channels, at least I thought, being processed. Turns out he was doing matrix processing. L oh. plus R on one box, mm -hmm, L minus yeah. R on the other. Yep. And I was like, wait a minute. Okay, I've read about that technique and then, you know, using microphone recordings I did for jazz and some classical stuff. First time I heard it and I was like, wow. And that was my introduction to the DAP 310. And from there on in, everything I did with DAP 310s that I did use, I, I did matrixing, traditional left, right, did a lot of funky stuff. The box did exactly what it was supposed to and then some, created a signature sound in the mark that most of my competitors could never figure out how we did it. I actually got a visit by the FCC once because my competitor claimed I was overmodulating. I said, well, that wasn't the case. Not my, sub, my fault. You, you know, don't understand perceived loudness. And this was before the, uh, you know, mm -hmm. the loudness meters came on the market. And then uh, I went on to the DAP 610, uh, which not, not too many people probably remember that one, but uh, that was the blue-faced introduction of the loudness meters and the LEDs and, and whatnot. And I think, if I remember correctly, when I had talked to you at the time, you had mentioned it was a new approach in clipping or limiting with forward-looking, forward, forward looking, I think is what you, you told me. Where you look at the input stage and decide where it should be on the out and how to control voltage for the limiter and all that kind of stuff. I was like, wow, this is an interesting approach and technique. So I used that on a jazz-formatted station along with some other boxes to keep everything sort of where it needs to be. And that station, too, we got a visit from the FCC. Yeah, yeah that was, uh, it seems like everywhere <laughs> I went with the DAP series... Uh, we received a visit. Trouble, huh? the, the good thing is it was totally legal, though. Well, see, now you fast forward to today, and if you understand, as you pointed out with uh, the audio psychoacoustics, if you understand energy, audio energy and loudness and perceived loudness, and we'll use the, you know, the new standard, the BS 1770-2 and all the other stuff, you could look back, those of us who've done this, you could look back and go, wow, you know, we were doing this without realizing it. You know, in the loudness wars. I mean, you know, I, I worked in the New York City market, Long Island, New Jersey, Connecticut, uh, parts of Hartford, so you know, it, loudness was what it was all about, whether you're on AM or FM. But I used, yeah, I used the uh, the DAP 310 on an AM stations. I've used it on FM stations. Uh, did matrixing with it. It was a versatile box. And well, now I have to say, we know how old you are now. That that <laughs> goes back. Uh, <laughs> yes, it does. But I have to say, anyone in the business that's doing audio and and, and transmission, uh, those boxes definitely taught you something. Now, you could have easily taken the other box that was on the market at the time, that beige-looking box, and done stuff with it, too. But it, 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 that box had a sound no matter who played with the knobs. Your box and your approach, the sound came from the person working it because no two people could set up a DAP 310 the same way. Well, and it's interesting that as you listen to a market, uh, everybody had their, even though you knew seven of the stations in the market had the processor, the, there were seven different sounding stations, hmm. especially if they were the same format. Remember WABC or what was it? PLJ was the PLJ, FM. PLJ, oh, yeah. And they had those things just, they couldn't be any faster on recovery. <laughs> they just absolutely, uh, everything that was 99.9% .9 all the time. Exactly. That was a classic, yeah, WPLJ, New York City. Um, I forget the engineer's name. I met him so many times. Bob, uh, Bob um, Robert. Um, Bob oh, McGregor? Uh, no. Uh, no, no, not he Bob McGregor. To, he, no, he went to uh, Detroit later. but uh, Yes, he did. And he was but, a, uh, really a nice guy. It was the programmer that wanted it that way. Uh, wanted that Larry Berger. Dense. Yes, yes. Yeah, yeah they, that, that station, the, the, the running joke we always had in the market, uh, was you can stand on there, wave their composite signal if you took it out of the detector <laughs> of an FM. Uh, if you didn't see a straight line when looking at the composite signal of that station, you knew somebody was either on vacation or they were on a backup <laughs> site that they weren't aware of. Uh, they, they, they definitely, you know, if you wanted to compete, you had to have a sound or a brick wall. And, yeah. uh, you know, years later, you know, years later other, other people came along with some new stuff at other stations. You know, if it was Malorite, it was all right. So they had some good stuff and, you know, some strict competition. 
But uh, it was, yeah, those boxes, you could do a lot. You know, you set the FETs, change the bias a little bit, and, and uh, you, have, you have some fun. Well, that, <laughs> Chris, you, you, know, just, you just mentioned... Problem. You, you just sorry. mentioned something, Chris, that I was going to ask about, and that is the subject of FETs. Whenever you talk to an engineer, a knowledgeable one, about setting up uh, DAP, the DAP 310, the, the phrase FE, the acronym FET comes along. Mike, would you expound on that a little bit? What, what are FETs, and why did we have to fiddle with the control so much about those? Well, these were, oh, and I hated it too, uh, field effect transistors, and it would uh, shunt on an op amp where you were feeding audio uh, into this amp, it will allow audio to come in the other input, and uh, you have a, a half cycle, even at uh, 30 kilohertz, it would just go right after it. So you had a beautiful attack time that normally would sound bad if you listened wide band, but having three bands, you could get away with a heart attack. But the, hmm. but the FET, uh, in order to stay in the linear region, we had to have the impedance quite high. And yeah, since no. we were the first people playing with uh, op amps and all of this stuff, uh, boy, oh boy, I mean, you know, we wanted to be new and, you know, technically on top of things, uh, uh, but uh, boy, this was a, a, a hard lesson for everybody to learn that that was very touchy, and uh, I, there's no way around it, uh, hmm. just because of the way that this circuit worked. Uh, but a lot of fellows did good with it, and then later the FETs got better, and there was no heat and drift problems that we had in, in oh. the beginning. And that uh, uh, we really had to regulate the heck out of that power supply, but you still had, uh, you know, just ambient temperature of a box in a rack, uh, especially at a transmitter site where the temperature can go down at night and come up in the day, and this thing would walk around a little bit. Uh -huh. The 610, of course, that was taken care of because that was a digital control, and we were the first at that, too. But, oh, uh, really? It, so the, the, this was the, the follow-on product, right? The DAP yeah. 610. Okay. Uh-huh. Uh, and it, it, uh, it was a hair dryer because it has over 100 chips in it. It uh, was. Oh. <laughs> oh. I mean, but you're, that's, you're listening to one because that's how I'm getting it over to you. Can I put the camera on that once? Yeah. Oh, my uh, sure I do. I just, all right. Uh, there, oh, there is a zoom here uh, control. Let me just see if I can zoom up a little bit and uh, hit the plus, plus, plus. So that's it. Um, sorry, I'm not in front of the microphone and trying to run camera. Not doing a very good job, but that unit with the you see the pink up there. That is yeah. the uh, six ten. That's oh, a yeah. silver face six ten. Three pink red meters, and then there's a green yeah. meter. And then the okay. output meter, which you're familiar with, and the um, the idea uh, in uh, having a digital control, and that was the feed forward uh, uh, idea that we could uh, instead of being a servo loop like the old 310, this uh, would be set up where you're feeding both the control and the output stage, and if you need it, you could delay the output stage a little bit so the control would you know, have it handled, but we wound up being able not, or not having to do that. So the 610 will also know with what's feeding it. So it, it, uh, I'm pretty proud of that point that it, uh, it's fairly real time. I'm sure there are more stories to tell. And in fact, we're going to, uh, after the break here, uh, in, in just a couple minutes, we're going to talk about, I heard stories that Mike Duro, uh, had a bunch of these boxes in the trunk of his car. And uh, and went to stations and showed them how good they could sound and and uh, and the, I guess you ended up leaving with uh, with a lot of checks or cash at some point and then why did the six ten come along and then where did it go what happened to it uh, also I don't want to I want to be sure and not leave Chris Tar on this Chris what you it, bet yeah they're they're in in uh, in Milwaukee what experience do you have with a with a DAP processor. Well, I, you know, the, the first uh, big FM station I worked for actually had a big hundred thousand watt FM use the DAP. And uh, what I remember about it, back then I was on the air, was the station sounded just huge. It had this, you know, very clean audio. And, of course, back then, you know, FM, it was at the kind of the like, – right before the beginning of the loudness wars. It had the cleanest signal I would ever heard at an FM station. It was fantastic. And then, of course, later on I worked at AM stations that had the, the 310s in them. I'm still, you know, every time I see one for sale, I go to look because you know, at some point, I, you know – I still want to get my hands on one to actually tinker with now that I'm older and actually know what I'm doing with them. But uh, 
Yeah, you know, I, I think there's, especially for some reason, you know, that I've seen at a lot of the stations here in the Midwest that I've done uh, engineering for, you know, they may not be in line anymore. A lot of, they, they actually, they get a lot of use. I still see a lot of them in use is for things like, um, you know, remote receivers for just as an, you know, AGC coming out of a, you know, a Marty or a, you know, a POTS codec or something like that. But I still see a lot of them out in the wild. It, it's, it's pretty impressive the amount that, that I see. And, you know, everybody that I know that's used them have also the same thing, which is it is, it is the cleanest processor, uh, you know, that, that they've ever worked with. And I, I kind of echo uh, Chris's thoughts. I do a lot of matrix processing. In fact, most of the FMs that I've done audio processing for, I still use a matrix method using various boxes. But I could see, a, I could totally see with a with a, a DAP how, you know, doing something like that could really uh, produce a really nice effect. Especially again with as well thought out and as clean as the the audio processing is. And I'm I'm sure you'll talk about this in a little bit. But you know what you were looking to do with an audio processor was at the time kind of an entirely different way of thinking uh, simply because it wasn't meant to be a loudness box. And I think, it, you know, that was an interesting uh, difference in that product that, you know, byproduct of it was that you were louder, but it was designed more as a, um, you know, more as a musical instrument, I guess is a good way to put it. And so I'll be interested to hear, you know, once we, we get back into the conversation, kind of how you feel that things have gone the direction that things have gone, uh, you know, in the year since the release of the DAP. And uh, we, we, we will do that. We're going to take a, a, a quick uh, uh, moment and hear something from our sponsor. Uh, this show is being brought to you by, by the way, you are watching or listening to This Week in Radio Tech. We're at episode 155. Chris Tarr is with us. Also, Chris Tobin from New York. And Michael Duro of Duro Electronics and the famous uh, DAP310, DAP610, and those famous loudness meters, the Duro loudness and peak meters that we've seen so many times in, in broadcasting. Uh, Michael is the guy behind uh, all of that. Uh, our show is being brought to you by my employer. I thank them very much for sponsoring the show. Uh, Axia Audio is a sponsor this time, and I got a box here. I'd like to uh, like to show you if I can get this properly up in front of the camera. I don't. We haven't talked about these much on the show. This is one of the uh, Axia Audio nodes. This is how you get from the analog or AES world into the live wire a, uh, audio over IP world, or from audio over IP back to. Uh, analog or AES. So this is the node. This is the interfacing device uh, to uh, interface things that don't already have a live wire jack on them, for example. Well, this one's pretty cool. Uh, we, we introduced these about a year ago, and uh, typically these are four stereo inputs and four stereo outputs. It's a half rack of space, so you can mount two of them together in a rack, or you don't have to mount them in a rack. Uh, they, come, they all come with rack mount kits in the box, and also a kit to tie two of them together and rack mount them. But if you, know, if you just need to slip one of these into a, a cabinet somewhere to give you a little bit of, of uh, input output to the live wire system that you have in your studio, well, this is the box to do it. It's also um, this one, well, this one right here, is uh, what we call our mixed node. It has a mixture of mic level and analog inputs and outputs and an AES input and output. It also has a GPIO, two of those ports, so there's a total of uh, 10 GPIs and 10 GPOs available on this box. Uh, there's a place for two Ethernet connections, uh, you can uh, you can connect these to you know, two different edge switches and have redundancy on the Ethernet connections. And of course, there's a there's a, a power plug there. Uh, on the front, there is uh, this beautiful OLED display. Uh, you can flip it to different screens and uh, look at status and the IP address and software version and all that kind of stuff, uh, or get it back around to the input and output levels, you may notice that uh, on the far left of that screen, there's an input level going on, and that's coming from a microphone I have here just off to the side. That's the mic level going in. And the audio that's coming out, well, that's coming from a, a music server that I have here at the uh, Harnack office. Uh, so it's just playing music full-time there, and this is subscribed to that, as are a number of other devices uh, on my Axia network here at my office. There's one more thing I want to show you. It's pretty cool. This actually has dual power supplies, but you only see one power entrance on the back. Well, we can unplug the AC power from this, and look, it still runs. 
That's because it's being powered uh, two ways by you know commercial power, 110 volts coming in, and by power over Ethernet. Uh, the the box the node uh, has takes less than 15 watts of power and that's the power budget for PoE so it's actually being powered by a PoE port on one of my switches uh, across the room and that's uh, keeping it lit up and keeping it operating um, so two ways to power it and that's that's pretty cool you don't have to power it uh, but one way or the other or both ways if you like so the the, the also I want to point out the uh, X node from Axia is um, uh, compliant with uh, Ravenna, so it can talk to Ravenna uh, IP audio uh, streams. And it's also ready to go with uh, whatever becomes, whatever comes out of the X192 standard. So if you're into IP audio, you might know that there, there, uh, there are groups working on new standards so that different brands of equipment will talk to each other. Uh, Telos, uh, Axia is a founding uh, sponsor, a member of that group. And uh, so the X node is uh, going to be compatible with whatever uh, they come out there. It's got the hardware built in to, to handle the way that that's going to work. So check it out on the web at axiaaudio.com, and you can check out the X nodes on that website as well. Thanks very much to Axia for sponsoring uh, This Week in Radio Tech. All right, episode 155, we're talking to Mike Durow. Uh, along with us are Chris Tobin from New York City. Hello, Chris. And also... Uh, Chris Tarr from Muckwanago, Wisconsin. We're talking audio processing with uh, with Mike Duro, who um, you know I think he's he's the he's the, he's the grandfather of uh, multiband audio processing. Mike, would you give yourself that uh, that title? Oh yeah, the old the old man of it. You know, it's been <laughs> a lot of fun. Though, I'll, I'll say. And it kept me from having to work for the other guy for all these many years, which I really appreciate because I had a hard time holding a job. But I worked for every station in town, you know, <laughs> until this all came about. So <laughs> that's great. <laughs> so okay, so when we before we went to the break, um, I was uh, asking you about. You, okay, so you built this this DAP three ten, and you were you probably what selling a few to your friends and trying them out on different stations. You you got a design down that looked good. How did you make this thing commercially popular? Well, there was actually um, a bunch of composite versions through the years. It started back in 1963. And I must say that uh, I worked uh, for uh, Casey Kaseman and Bob Hudson. They had a little recording studio. Uh, and because they were two popular disc jockeys, uh, when they opened up the studio and I got hired as, a, I guess, engineer and mixer, we were able to start working with some of the top people uh, on record at that time uh, because of their reputation. I guess these different artists, and I didn't think about it then, probably were hoping that Casey or uh, Bob would come in to the studio and uh, see what their, the, the artist is up to, and hopefully that would help them get airplay. Mm -hmm. And I guess it had happened on occasion. Uh, but uh, they allowed me the freedom to, you know, I was picking up limiters from radio stations, and uh, I think we were, uh, other than Columbia and RCA, which had limiters, you know, for the cutting lathe and such, we actually had limiters in the rack and uh, parametric equalizers, and that's where the experimenting started, and that was back in 1963. Then I started building composite versions, uh, and, uh, you know, when the transistor came along, that really helped to get things down smaller, but... Uh, still, it was a rack full of uh, tall rack of, uh, of amplifiers, and uh, up to the well. In fact, uh, one of the early uh, uh, Los Mondes lab, the op amp labs uh, unit, uh, I flew off to Texas uh, to meet with uh, Rod Matthews at uh, KRLD, and uh, hmm. we mm -hmm. put that unit on there. This was back in '67 or '68. And we could hear a difference out here in L.A. at nighttime. I mean, it just, you know, so uh, I just had to get this thing built. And I couldn't get other manufacturers interested in it. They felt that, why does it take three to do what one good one would do? So they didn't really understand the concept. Oh. And uh, so finally, Kay and I just started building them after Mike Callahan's help uh, and another fellow, Rod Standridge, uh, Building them on our kitchen table, so that that's really true. <laughs> yeah. We, yeah, and and there there are pictures to prove this. Uh, you know, you move everything away to have dinner, and then put it all back again to continue working. Uh, 
<laughs> Go and back to again, soldering. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So we had about 20 or maybe 30 units out there, and we're deep in debt. And this is why I mentioned that KYNO station in Fresno, that when they put this thing on the air, uh, and, you know, it just took off. And it was just a blessing because uh, uh, it just wasn't, we weren't sure. I mean, we could hear it and uh, loved it, but uh, again, uh, just was slow to take off for that first year or two, and then boom. And guys have done better jobs now than uh, you know what we had back then. But uh, it's just a a great kickoff. And uh, what I was you know, always interested in, uh, you know, the presentation of audio. And this is we had a problem with the VU meter and also with peak meters. And you, you, even combining them, you would still have confusion and arguments. And uh, Chris, well, I know we hadn't allowed you to have much to say, so I won't rattle on. But uh, uh, that's why I, I just threw myself into the metering, and uh, I just I wanted to get out from underneath the DAP also because transmitter manufacturers were pushing this positive modulation, and mm -hmm. uh, you you guys as hams know there's no such thing as uh, positive peaks because that's side banding when you go beyond the carrier with the uh, the, these peaks why of course it, if you don't have the synchronous detector and the receiver it, it really roughs up the sound you yeah. get the gurgles from the low frequencies and so I, I've just sold on symmetrical modulation and so we were going against a bunch of transmitter manufacturers that we could put the DAP on an old Collins and just blow a hole in the dial and uh, you know, there was one manufacturer of the transmitters that sold our unit, and it always say, we want it shipped at this time. They wanted to make sure their transmitter was in place before the processing showed up. I can say all this now because I don't think anybody's making transmitters <laughs> anymore, are they, <laughs> for AM? I don't know what's happening. <laughs> yeah. I, th I think Nautel is and, ha and Harris is, but I, I don't know how many, uh, how many are going out the door. Hey, yeah. uh, so... Um, uh, so let's talk about the metering for a few minutes. You know, uh, so a lot of folks only know about Duro from the, the the metering. I should have gotten them. I've got a couple of your meters back in my in my rack room here, and I forgot to get them out before the show. But these are the famous meters that are that are lots of LEDs in an in an arc uh, shape, and they change color as you go across. But there's two meters built into one. Uh, what does that mean? Well, it, you know, it's uh, if I can liken it to uh, looking at a car dashboard, you have a tachometer and you have a speedometer. And whichever yeah. gets to red line first. And the idea that we know, uh, let's say in a female voice, and if I can say use uh, a peak meter for a reference, if we uh, take a male voice and set up a, the peak level, whatever it be, and now set a female at the same peak, the female sounds louder because she's more sinusoidal. So she has more power under the curve, under that peak. Uh, yet mm. both of them have the same level, but one sounds louder. Uh, just the opposite mm. with a VU, where the female has enough power to get the meter up, you know, moving around to, at zero. The male yeah. is uh, very asymmetrical and staccato uh, at the peak. So uh, the meter hardly gets off you know, the rest and the guy's already up there with peaks. Uh, so uh, if you run him up at the same level as a female on a VU, he's much yeah. louder. So mm -hmm. those two argue uh, one way or the other. but And they both go back to the 30s. I think the peak uh, meter was first uh, because we were measuring current from tubes and such with TU meters. And and uh, and finally, we came up with the, the VU, which became the standard agreed by, uh, you know, arbitrarily by CBS, NBC, and, and others, uh, Western Electric and such. Uh, so I wanted to just, based on the physics of uh, what's underneath the curve, and if you put a tone into the meter, both go to the same point where it, technically the peak should be 3 dB higher. But we're not yeah. looking at tone. We're talking about program and how we're affected. Uh, in the power. So huh. uh, it, it agrees with your ear, no matter what kind of programming you put into it, it's, you know, it's, it's going to show it either peak or, 
are the persistence, and the peak is 12 dB up. So it shows that we, we're not equal in amplitude, but we're equal in power. And this is another argument about the 610, that it knew these things. So one of the problems we had with it is the managers would say, well, I'm looking at one song, and it's right up there at 100%, and the next one is down, uh, you know, 3 dB. Yeah. And that's be because, again, it's, you know, holding... So you'd always set modulation up with the pink noise and then just... Ah, know. yeah. That's why those had pink noise generators in them. Yeah. Gotcha. So, um, yeah, so, so this, this Duro loudness meter. Now, um, I, I... Well, a, a guy that we both do, uh, Sam Phillips... He owned uh, some radio stations in Memphis. This is the guy who owned Sun Recording the day that Elvis walked in the door and recorded That's All Right, Mama. Um, as Sam, I, I had the pleasure of, of working for Sam at some of his radio stations and doing his engineering for him. This would have been back in the late 80s and early 90s. Uh, and Sam had a couple of, of these uh, Duro, uh, the, the DAP 610s, mm. but he also had uh, several of your loudness meters. So that's where I saw those first. Chris Tarr, you got any Duro loudness meters at your stations? I sure do, and I love them. They actually, I, I love using them for uh, setting processing, specifically because of the dynamics that he's talking about. You can, you can at one look, uh, take you can identify the density of your processing as opposed to the loudness. Uh, you know how close you're getting from the the average meter versus the peak, and you know. Uh, so yeah, they they are a fantastic tool if you're any kind of of processing guy. So uh, you know, honestly. Um, I, I never looked at them really closely enough to pay attention to all the all the DB markings on them. Um, would anybody be mad at me if I said that I just thought they were really pretty? <laughs> <laughs> no, they, they have they have what I like to call a high LPD factor, lights per device. Uh, <laughs> and you know, I, I always joked about how I knew, you know, I knew I had the processing set right for my CHR station when the entire thing just kind of lit up. Uh, you know, you're. Everything was this way, and then the the, you know, the average portion of it went over there and matched it, and it just kind of hung there, and you uh, knew that you were nice and loud at that point. <laughs> well, do you know the reason hey, I, we I, trade? Yep. I'm sorry. No, I, I, I want to just interject real quick. Chris Tobin has to leave here in just a minute, and I wanted Chris to get a, a, a last-minute question uh, in before he has to go. Oh, okay. No, I appreciate that. Uh, I just wanted to say that the loudness meter had to be the best introduction to understanding how to do audio on the radio uh, in a long time, with the DAP 610 first introduced, and I was playing with it and trying to understand it. I'm like, wow, this is interesting. And then years later, as the uh, the Duro 1200 test uh, panel that I've used, I still have one. Um, I used a lot. It uh, it's just unbelievable what you can do with it. That that one unit alone. I've shown folks. I've done some uh, college demonstrations, and they're like, you can do this. this just flip the switch, L minus R. Then you see this, and you, let's go down and how deep we can see what's going on across the talk. Or creating nulls if you're doing any kind of stereo phasing. Absolutely brilliant. And um, you know, it's a shame that a lot of people sometimes don't really appreciate the, the, the metering and what you've done. And in conjunction with all the other folks and all the, the uh, outgrowth, of what that's done for, for folks in the audio industry. And now, now in television. I mean, I've gone to many TV control rooms. And it's fun to see a you know, DeRoe meter and go, oh, yeah, I used his other products and I actually talked to that guy. It's pretty cool. Yeah. And Chris, some folks just so don't get much. it. That's that's very kind. Thank you very much. And you guys have done a wonderful job. And you guys have a great history yourself. And uh, I'd love to hear more uh, about what you guys have gone through. But I appreciate sure. that very much. And I'm still in love with audio, still play with it. And the meter has, even the DAP, we still have done maintenance, uh, repairing DAPs, just now running out of parts for 610s. But, uh, and the meters, of course, will always take care of. And it's still, it just keeps going. So, you know, look, I've been blessed, uh, a nice family, and uh, so I have no regrets. And I'm so proud of Frank Foti and what he's done. You know, when he first brought out that processor here some years back, it, it was so strikingly beautiful compared to anything that anyone had. I mean, most, most manufacturers had panels with meters and knobs and things in it. This thing was incredible. And I saw all the copycats that looked like some sort of bubblegum dispenser that rack mounts. I mean, he just really shook up the industry with that, and a wonderful unit it is. Really sweet. So, thanks, you guys. This has just been terrific for letting me rattle on. I'm I'm awfully glad that that uh, the subject of the Duro 1200 a stereo signal test set was brought up. I never worked at stations 
that were big enough or rich enough to afford one of these things. It's a two rack unit box. It's got it's got two Duro meters on it for left and right or for matrix. And then it's got this huge knob on it to set the the, the level in in DB. How much gain was it going to have in DB? Or uh, it, it, if hey, if you're listening to or watching the show, you ought to you ought to Google this Duro twelve hundred. Uh, it's still something that's sold, right? Right, Mike. You still mm-hmm. uh, yep. ship these things? It absolutely is. It's. It's used by recording people, too, because they can use it for the sum and difference. So they have yeah. left, right, the sum, which they can flip phase to add or subtract, and the difference. So if they want to build the vocal up and or the left, right up. So it's still an effects device, too, as well as a you know, nice piece of test gear. Yeah. You know, come think about I have seen these in recording studios now that you mention it, not just radio stations. But I, I never got a chance to uh, to use one at a radio station. I, I'd always have to remove a Duro uh, stereo uh, set of meters from, from one room where they live <laughs> and, and, and go alligator clip them to whatever it was I wanted to measure in another room. So, yeah, I, I, I had a great, uh, Kirk, I had a great setup at Intercom with that. I actually had a, my a router output set to those meters, so I could pretty much oh. run anything I wanted to that <laughs> test set. Yeah. And here's here's a true here's a story for you know we're we're talking about stories. Um I I was working on audio processing for one of our FMs and it, you know I, I could never get it to sound right. It always sounded a little off and I just could never figure out why. Well, one night I had to do some shuffling around of some audio pairs. And uh I, you know, I had the test set on and, and I said, "Okay, well we're going to, you know, we're going to switch these cables around, so I need you to pull a channel on the output of our AGC that that fed the the wiring that went under the parking lot out to the STL and off to the transfer site. So I said, okay, you know, go ahead and pull the wire. And he pulls the wire, and I still see two channels on the on the Duro meter. And I said, I told you to pull the channel. What are you waiting for? And, he, and all of a sudden, I see his arm reach out, and there's, you know, an XLR dangling from it. And he said, it is unplugged. <laughs> well, you know, we... You know, sure enough, you know, he, I have him plug it back in, and I flip it to L minus R, and, you know, there's, it's nothing. And, uh, well, it turns out that somewhere underground, uh, the, the, the audio pairs had shorted out and forever it had been doing dual channel mono. Oh, and I, I was like, wow, wow. So we went through and, you know, did a couple of things and got it hooked up right. And all of a sudden the audio sounded fantastic, but I, I just it cracked me up because I, you know, I was yelling at him to pull this cable out because like I was using the, the meters as a reference to know when he pulled the channel. And they were just still going away. And I was like, pull the channel. And there he is with the, th- the cable dangling from his hand. So, uh, but, you know, yeah, those, those meters are, are so great for troubleshooting and for stereo. And, um, you know, it, it is one of those things that they're, they're just a pleasure to work with. Oh, thank you. That's, that's just terrific. You know, and it's what it's, I find it very useful to just even plug a microphone in and beller into the mic just to see what the output level is. And you can, by turning the calibrated, you know, attenuator, you've, it'll tell you it's you know, your minus 40 or what have you. So hopefully it, it becomes not only a, a, a fun box to, you know, to work with, but as a, an important piece of test gear too. So Boy, I, I, thanks, I wanted guys. to get your, I, I wanted to get your opinion on this. I, I kind of touched on it before and, and, you know, listening to you talk and, and having used these, these boxes before, and I'm certainly not calling out any new manufacturers, but, you know, what's your opinion on how audio processing has gone over the years? You know, it just, you know, all of a sudden now with digital, uh, you know, you can you know, turn everything to 11 and get this wall of sound thing. And it seems to me, and I could be wrong, but it seems to me that really wasn't your design goal way back then. Your design goal was a, a box that was kind of transparent and musical. And instead of trying to, you know, have something that was super loud, you wanted something that was very musical. And I just want your opinion, you know, how do you, you know, what do you think of the sound and, and, and the audio that's being generated nowadays with these new boxes? Well, uh, some of the boxes, and especially I have to say the Omnia, allows you to do many things with it. You can use it for classical or what have you. But, you know, it, um we never had a wideband compressor protect our multiband. It was the multiband that did all the work. I still hear the wideband that floats around with a floating platform on one particular band. Uh, and I think, that, again, back to Frank Foti did a wonderful job of really keeping that thing low profile, that part of it. I remember uh, we were at an AES here about 10 years ago, and he was demonstrating... 
the processing, and he really ran the gain deep into that processor. And I, uh, we were with a lot of audio engineers, and I, I guess if they think of a limiter, they think that's going to limit, you know, their their music. So it's it's like a bad word. But he was showing how deep you could go into it and not feel it modifying, you know, the program. Mm. Uh, so mm. it didn't, you know, I, I I felt he didn't get the response he should have gotten from that. I was really impressed because if we did that, we'd be, you know, flat topping the front end of the. A 310 or a 610 so it was well, I, quite amazing it's interesting you know a lot of still a lot of design uh uses a wideband uh agc as a first stage and I, I actually um you know to to throw it all out there i use a uh, ariane with uh 8400 or 8500 uh, optimods in some of my stations but i always disable the wideband agc and use the uh, the ariane as the agc which is a, a basically a four band uh, AGC mm -hmm. and matrix processor, and I've always liked that better. But it's it's amazing how many people think you have to have you know a single band wide band AGC. And you're right with with Frank's Omnia boxes, the the wide band AGC on those are fantastic, mm -hmm. best I've heard. And, and but it's unusual in a, in a in a processor. Most other processors have just really bad wide band AGCs, but. I see. I find that a lot of engineers, kind of, and audio guys, have this thing in their head that multi-band AGCs are bad because you know it. it they seem to think that the you know very slow attack and release on a wideband AGC is the you know is the most pristine way to go. And you know, there's a whole different argument for that. But but you're right. Well, I, it, it, you know. Yeah, I suppose you'd have the flanging effect if you didn't have something stop that level from going into those, you know, tight bands. Uh, and that, again, was uh, things I was lucky enough, even though it was very composite and a lot of wires and amplifiers laying on a bench, but able to get around all of that. I still have a prototype 8-band uh, that I built back in, I think, 66 with uh, spectrosonic cards. Hmm. Uh, oh, and uh, s same thing that, uh, from it that you hear today with uh, too many bands if you don't use that wide band front end, boy, you'll really feel those modifying and uh, gets pretty dense and you can't make me listen. <laughs> you know, during the show here, I've, I've been looking through a lot of images. If you go to images.google.com and, you know, look for anything Duro, you can find lots of cool stuff. And, you know, I was familiar with, I guess, the, the black-faced uh, discriminant audio processor, the Model 310, that, that had the, the brushed uh, black face and the white meters. But here I see one that's got a silver face. And um, uh, tell me, you, you know, how, how does, how, as a manufacturer, how do you uh, decide to move along? Is it m materials that are available or you just decide that it needs spiffing up? What, what makes your we decision had, uh, in, in how it looks? We had both the silver face and a blue face because uh, uh, BE had blue cabinets and um, oh okay you know just by request it was just an anodized front and a silk screen all the lettering so it could be mm -hmm. any color I know for um, a station in Canada we had a gold color for their SCA and you know so they had their different colored six tens uh, but really it's basically the same box I see. I see different people yeah, yeah, maybe for FM or or short wave or what have you but. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, I see that the the, the six tens that I was familiar with were blue, and then there were some some like I said some black faced uh, three tens, and then here's a silver faced uh, uh, three ten. So, wow. Um, it's yeah. It's 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 it's, it's pretty. Oh, I'm looking at a website that just has all kinds of things like the old uh, Multimax from PR and E. Remember that? Yeah. And the uh, Greg Labs uh, uh, multiband uh, box. Wow. Wow. Okay. This is at. Uh, uh, 261.gr, they have a, a, a vintage page. Well, um, uh, I, I want to spend a couple more minutes on the meters, though. We were talking about the meters. Mm -hmm. And uh, I guess the, a, a lay person, uh, an engineer unfamiliar with them, might look at them and just say, oh, it's, it's a meter that's real pretty. But you've got some smarts going on in there because you display the, what, the, the, the loudness and the peak level. And yet you put these I, – I think – to me, kind of, it's kind of magic that you display these both on the same on the same uh, uh, LED scale. You probably, you know, 
jotted well, this down you know, we, and figured it out not too long. We ago. trademarked the eyebrow curve because that really helps. We're used to the you know the old meter where the scale is is rounded, and that felt very important to me. Even if you couldn't see, as you were mentioning earlier, the the dB, the numbers, you had a feel of where it would ride, and ah. uh, so that was the idea. Though there's we have the straight line versions too. I, one I call the T bird turning right. You know. Uh, horizontal and the vertical scales, especially when people have a lot to, to put in in a small space. So, yeah. But uh, the 40A has always been my my favorite. The the curve. Uh, boy, you ask something else in there, and I'm slipping at this. Oh, at I, this I was just wondering age. about the the. Uh, uh, I mean, I guess we really can't describe the, the circuitry here on a, on a, on a talk show. But uh, so you, you've got you've got circuits that determine the loudness and another one determines the the peak level and yet you integrate these into the same into the same display and i just think that's kind of magical i guess if i looked at the schematic i, I it would make sense but uh, tell us a, a little bit about how you integrate these two pieces of information into one display well that's all done with the drivers and and that that would be sort of a common thing uh, kirk uh, uh, as you do look at the schematic you'll say okay uh, that makes sense and the ballistics are really both peak but one's weighted and that's why when oh. you put a tone on, it'll, the peak will jump up instantly, and then you'll see the uh, persistence catch right up to it, and they, they both end up at the... Is this ringing in my head bothering you guys? <laughs> it's, <laughs> I, I'm hearing it. <laughs> you know, look, I, uh, this, I've not ever rattled on like this ever, uh, and I really appreciate this, Kirk, because, you know, you guys have done a lot of good stuff, and uh, maybe it's your turn to be interviewed by gosh should i be the guy that do that <laughs> oh and it's andrew zarian nice. interviewed me and, and and it was, uh, it was I, I thought it was a pretty boring show despite andrew's best efforts <laughs> um hey well actually we're it's probably probably a good time to to wrap it up and, and maybe ask one more question we are about out of time we've gone on for an hour now and heard a lot about the the, the 310 something about the the dap 610 and your philosophy behind you know ab about multi bands and, and how you started this notion and about the uh, the metering techniques uh which uh which your your company is still producing lots of meters by the way i noticed that you produce uh, uh meters that connect to analog circuitry and also uh i guess i didn't realize you connect have meters that that aes will plug right into yeah mm -hmm. yeah it's uh it's uh, and they and what's so interesting if you take the analog and the um, aes uh which is just looking at the the bit stream uh and you play some old 78s you might see a record click on the analog that may not be totally captured by the digital and it's hmm. interesting to watch the two track but they do very very well uh, both the analog, depending on what type of filtering is built into whatever power amp that's feeding the device. But uh, yeah, we've been very, very fortunate with it. And with the DAP, it's a cult thing with a lot of radio hams. And uh, I'm kind of delighted about that. that uh, a lot of these guys are saving the transmitters, they're saving consoles, and uh, now some old DAP processing. So. Kurt, thank you very much, and both uh, Chris uh, and Chris, thank you. Uh, just really terrific. Uh, really enjoyed this very much. And, uh, well, uh, we thank you. And Chris, uh, Tar, uh, do you have any last-minute uh, comments or anything you'd like to mention before we have to go? No, it's been fantastic. I mean, very rarely do you get to sit and, and you know listen to the thoughts of, of, <laughs> of, a, of a gentleman <laughs> of your caliber. So uh, it has been uh, – the pleasure really has been all of ours. No. Uh, I, I will Boy. tell you that in the sh in the show notes for the show, we're going to put a, f a few links in there, uh, links to uh, some vintage equipment, some you know the older uh, DAP 310 and 610 gear. Uh, then uh, we'll also have uh, a few links to some YouTube videos. There's plenty of examples. Uh, if you're not familiar with what what these meters look like and and the me the meaning that they convey, very simply and very effectively, there's plenty of videos on YouTube that that de demonstrate what uh, Duro loudness meters do. So we'll provide you with a couple of links. To those in our in our show notes mike uh thank you so much for being with us also thanks to uh to your lovely uh, wife Kay for helping to uh, get you scheduled you bet thank you very much and she's delighted thanks all right thank you all right thanks to uh uh chris tobin who had to leave a few minutes ago chris tar who's uh, with us and mike duro also thanks to andrew zarian at the gfq network getting ready for yeah. a big snowstorm He's uh he's been switching the show and I sure appreciate his help and uh, his work. Yeah, 
Terrific. Also, uh, Axia Audio, the sponsor of this episode of This Week in Radio Tech. Check them out on the web at axiaaudio.com. Today we talked about the new X nodes, uh, the way to get uh, audio in and out of a live wire system when you're just dealing with uh, old non-live wire gear. All right, we'll see you next week on This Week in Radio Tech. Bye-bye. That's all the bandwidth we can pill for this week. Another tort is propagated, and all the transmitters and audio equipment live happily ever after, thanks to the handsome engineer and his kind, benevolent care. We'll be back next week. Lord willing, and the creek don't rise. This week in Radio Tech. Subscribe to iTunes, and you'll never miss a show. Search for This Week in Radio Tech in the iTunes Store. Soliciting is strictly encouraged. If you like today's show, tell a friend. If you didn't like it, we were never here. Kirk Hartnack's wardrobe provided by the Salvation Army and the Red Cross Disaster Relief Services. Hair and makeup provided by Penny Lope Garcia Hernandez Weinberg. He's unique, wouldn't you say? I just want to get it over with. This ends this transmission. Tango, Whiskey, India, Romeo, Tango. Signing off. Okay. Okay. <laughs>